we're thinking about the voices of God and the way that God talks to us. And as we've thought about how he does that, we've thought about creation and we've thought about Christ, thought about what God communicates to us from the cross. And we thought about what God, how God communicates to us through covenant. But communication is a two-way street and it involves both hearing and listening. And it's the same with God. He speaks and we listen, but we, according to the Bible, we can tune him out. Here's what it says in the Old Testament. Jeremiah writes about these wicked people who refuse to listen to my words, who follow the stubbornness of their hearts and go after other gods to serve and worship them. It'd be like this belt, completely useless. And he describes a process whereby people end up turning to other gods, but it doesn't just go in that direction. It doesn't just land there. There's a process. And it seems to suggest that the process looks like this. They, they, these people who um, refuse to listen to my words. So that's the first stage. It's tuning God out. It's turning the volume down. And he's speaking, but not listening to him. No desire to listen. So that's the first stage. Tune out. And then when you tune God out, then you look for a place to try to figure out what can happen. Then you tune yourself in. Tune out, then tune in, and then turn from. It's not that we, and as Jeremiah describes people, it's not that it's, it's, it's immediately in opposition to God. There's a process. It's tune out, tune in self, and turn from. In the last of his letters, Paul looked ahead to dark times when this type of tuning out would occur, times when people would not be able to hear God's voice. This passage talks about, he says to Timothy, preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. But the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn away from the truth and turn aside to miss. Paul encourages Timothy to keep saying the things that Paul understands Timothy knows. And he says, Timothy, you need to keep on saying what you know, teaching what you know, because the time will come when you can't be speaking, but people won't be listening, that they will not be able to tune you in. He says that there will come a time when the people won't tolerate instruction. Um, if you grew up as a Jew and as a little kid, the first in first grade, age, the first level of school from ages six through 10, you went to synagogue school and you learned the first five books of the Bible. That's what you did in four years. And if you were a really good student, then you would go to the second tier of education, which is age 10 to approximately 14. And you would learn the rest of the Old Testament. And then if you were a really good student, then you would, from the age of 15 to 30, you would sit at the feet of a rabbi and you would memorize massive amounts of instruction. If you grew up, at, true, you, you, biblical instruction was not something necessarily pleasurable. You learn that I need to learn this stuff. I'm going to learn it, whether it's pleasurable or not. What Paul describes is going to become a time when in order for people to sit and listen, it will need to be pleasurable. It says instead to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. And what Paul does, he warns Timothy that there is coming a time where if the instruction is not pleasing, it will be tuned out. There's not the kind of discipline that would allow people to sit and listen to something that might not necessarily be pleasurable to hear. Now that's their education that in, in Israel was like that, but now they're in the Roman Empire. This is what Paul warns Timothy about. At that time, when there might be truth, but there's an inability to ingest the truth, then at that point, God could be speaking, but 
people wouldn't be listening. In the same letter, Paul goes on and he says, Mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, always learning but never able to acknowledge the truth. Paul describes in the last days, and the things that people love are the things that people tune into. It's the question that they ask. And so in the last days, people will determine what to do, where to go, based on three questions. Will it benefit me? Will it make me money? Will it give me pleasure? Because that's what you ask when lovers of self, lovers of money, lovers of pleasure. Will it benefit me? Will it make me money? Will it give me pleasure? What church should I go to? Those are the questions that will be asked. What occupation should I go into? And that's questions that will be asked. Will it benefit me? Will it make me money? Will it give me pleasure? And it's not that pleasure is wrong, that money is wrong, and that something that benefits self is wrong. But when it's when it's at the exclusion of us, when it's all about what I want, what will please me, what what I need rather than us. That's part of the thing. That's part of what Paul describes will lead to difficult times. Uh, and the problem is, is not just that it will be secular. He says, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. And when Paul looks ahead, he looks to a time where godliness will be tolerated when it's pleasurable. I'll listen and I'll do what I need to do if it pleases me to do it. But the ability to do something that might not be pleasing, the ability to listen to something that might not immediately be pleasing, that will, Paul says, be eroded over time. The problem is, in Paul's writing, and is that the road to pleasure and the road to God aren't the same road. It will lead to problems. It will lead to what he describes as always learning and never able to acknowledge the truth. Apparently, it's possible to hear and to understand some of the things that are being said, but not really able to acknowledge the truth of them, to learn but not really be able to understand deeply what's being communicated. That's what Paul writes when he tells Timothy about the times that are coming, and we could have an argument or a discussion about are we in those times where everything needs to be pleasurable in order to be listened to. Um, C.S. Lewis wrote in the middle of the 20th century, 20th century, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. The Bible seems to indicate is that in order to tune God's voice in, we're going to find ourselves experiencing things that we would not want to experience that as C.S. Lewis talks about, God does speak to us in the middle of things which are disagreeable and uncomfortable. The reason why we say that is not to try to make disagreeable things agreeable. It's to understand that if you're in the midst of something disagreeable, you're feeling things you don't want to feel, you're experiencing things you don't want to experience, you have to tolerate things you don't want to tolerate. If you could you would leave this circumstance and it would end. You don't want to stay there, but you can't get out of it. What the Bible describes is being in a situation like that. It's not pleasant. But it is a place where God speaks. And that's what C.S. Lewis indicates. He God shouts to us in the things that are difficult for us. And what we end up coming away with is not just something to benefit me, but something to benefit us. It's the way we're made usable. We learn things from God in the midst of struggles. 
that allow us to come alongside others so they might not be great as far as I am concerned, but in terms of allowing me to learn something that will be usable. And that's what God thinks about. God is not just concerned about us as individuals. He's just concerned about us as a community of people. And, and he allows us to experience things because in the midst of those difficulties, we can tune him in and we can learn things from him that allow us to come alongside someone else and help them by telling them what we learn from God. Um, there's a process in the Old Testament that described how God caused the Israelites as they go through the wilderness to listen to his voice. Look at what it says. Um, he humbled you. We talked about what humility is. Humility is when you're in a situation when you cannot use what you have to get what you want. That's what humility is. It's a situation where you experience the inability to use what you have to get what you want. So you're in a situation that you're experiencing this. You want not to experience that, and you can't figure out how to not experience that thing. That's a humbling experience, biblically. You can't use what you have to get what you want. He says, when he led the Israelites through the wilderness, he humbled them, put them in a situation where they couldn't use what they have to get what they want. How did he do that? It says, he humbled you, causing you to hunger. And sometimes we talk about how God either allows or causes something. He caused them to hunger. Hunger is a God-given alarm system that means that you are deprived of something that you cannot go without, without dying. So hunger is not something wrong. It's something natural, something God created in us. It says that he humbled them, causing them to hunger. How do you cause somebody to hunger? You interrupt access to food. You put them in a place where they are deprived of something that they cannot go without. God caused them to hunger. And then it says, then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your fathers had known. We talked about this. Manna, it's, it's from a uh, Hebrew word means, what is it? No, mana, what's that? And so it's, it was a means whereby God met their hunger need, but not in the most pleasurable way. It says, feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your fathers had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothes did not wear out and your feet did not swell during these 40 years. Know then in your heart that a man as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you. What's the goal? He leads him in the wilderness and puts him in places where they experience hunger and they don't have the ability to meet it themselves. Why would he do something like that? The goal, it says, to teach you that man does not live by bread alone but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord, bread comes from God's mouth. He said, let there be man. And what he was teaching them is to tune in, not to what they have, but to what they hear. Don't just tune into what you see, but tune into what he says. And when he interrupts the presence of needs, in that time, they would look up to him and complain, but they would talk with him. They would relate to him, and there would be the ability to speak and to hear that when God was teaching them, that was the goal, that he would teach them that man doesn't live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. And what this suggests is if God's going to get our attention and speak to us, we're going to find ourselves in situations that we really don't want to stay in. But in that situation that we don't want to stay in, apparently, that's the situation where we can come and hear God in a way that we couldn't if all our needs were met. Um, what's the strategy? Again, the goal is to teach you. The man doesn't live. Teach us. 
Man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. And the strategy is he humbled you, causing you to hunger, then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your fathers had known in the wilderness. It was a miraculous experience followed very quickly by a wilderness experience. It happened, it must have been like spiritual whiplash. They went through the Red Sea on dry land. And within two days after that, they were walking through the desert and were wondering if they were going to if they were going to get out alive, very right in proximity with one another. The, the the water experience and all kinds of miracles, and I can walk through this Red Sea on dry land, and everything's wonderful. Wall of water on the right, wall of water on the left. I'm walking through it, and the Isra the Egyptians come and they get swallowed up. Boy, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread, and and so it would have been wonderful to be able to stay on the banks of the Red Sea and just man, remember when that happened. Boy, I was walking through that, and then the but he doesn't do that. He immediately, he leads, he leads them into the wilderness. It's the same thing that happened with Jesus. When Jesus was baptized and the Spirit came down on him, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And, and it says the Spirit led him immediately into the wilderness to be tempted. And that seems to be how it is. We experience things that make us feel we see God's power. We find answers to prayer. And then we find ourselves in a place where the answers to prayer are not forthcoming. And we wondered, where did God go? He was here just a minute ago. I, I saw the miracle. I saw the water. I experienced it. He was right here. And, and now he's not here. Where did, it's, it's not that he isn't there. It's that in that place where we need to Focus on tuning him in. We learn to listen to God in the wilderness in a way that we do not learn to listen in the middle of a miracle. We learn to listen to God in the wilderness in a way that we do not learn to listen in the context of a miracle where all our needs are met. Um, seems like this is the hunger Humility, hearing. Hunger leads to humility. He humbles us. Humility leads to hearing. It says, know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, the Lord your God disciplines you. We've talked about the word. The word discipline, it comes from two words that are kind of scrunched together. To be with and a child. To discipline means to be with a child. And in the context, the focus of discipline is not on the past. It's not on the, the wrong done in the past. The focus of discipline is on the future. And we've all been raised by moms, and moms have ways of disciplining us. And the focus of discipline biblically and and when a mom does discipline, they're not just thinking about, you did that bad thing and I'm going to punish you. Now, sometimes that happens, but that's not really what discipline's about. What discipline is about, it's coming alongside a child, understanding that they need to learn, putting some corrective measure in place so that they will learn to do it right in the future. That's what discipline is about. The focus of discipline is not on the past. It's on the future. It's on putting the child in a place where they'll be able to, from this lesson, be able to do the right thing in the future. That's what discipline, how discipline should happen. But, and the motive of discipline is not anger. It's love. And sometimes love has to promote consequences in order for somebody to learn to do the thing that will allow them to function well in the future. Um, that's what it says. Know then in your heart, as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you. Huh? The Bible says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, because that's what he does. He'll put us in situations, 
And the goal is not to punish us for something we did wrong. Sometimes when we experience difficult things, our natural assumption is, well, I'm being punished for what I did wrong, but that's not the way God operates. He's not thinking about what we do wrong. He's thinking about what we will do right in the future. And it's not motivated by wrath. It's motivated by, by love. And my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. Do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Because the Lord disciplines those he loves. And he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. What do you have in your life right now that you would say is not good? Think about it. Something at work? Something at home? Personal life? Relational life? Physical life? You look at that thing and, and you call it, that's not what I want, but I can't change it. it. It indicates that those things that are in our life, he's saying endure hardship as discipline. When we experience hardship, we tend to believe God abandoned me. Where did he go? Why isn't he doing what he did before? And we tend to associate troubles with the absence of God's presence. But what this indicates is that troubles are not a sign of the absence of God. It's a sign of the presence of God. I want you to think. I want you to think. Times in your life where you learn something. Maybe something about God and about relating to him. I, I dare say. Can you think of that time? Do you think of those times? I would imagine they weren't pleasant, were they? When we learn deep lessons, it's not usually enjoyable. We can tend to believe that God's abandoned us. And what the writer is indicating, it's just the opposite. God disciplines those he loves. If there's nothing that you're struggling with right now, or over a period of time, spiritually, that's not a good sign. People with whom God is communicating are going to find themselves in places they don't want to be. And in that place, the difficult process of learning to call out to him, to cry out to him. When God actively is actively involved in making his voice heard, there will be problems that says, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. The word trained, it's the word from what we get the word, uh, it's the word gymnazo. It, it's, it's come from the word for gymnasium. Have you ever been to a gym and see people? Um, you know, they might be on the bench press machine and, they, and they're, they're not having a good time. <laughs> you know, you, if you say you're plopped in the middle of a weight thing, people aren't having a good time, sweating and they're just... <laughs> And why are they doing that? And it shows, well, there's a couple things. They want to lose something, lose extra weight, but they want to gain something. When we're in the midst of difficult things, we think, I wonder what God's trying to get rid of. But in discipline, it's not just about what God's taking away. It's what he's building. And in the midst of difficulties, we build spiritual muscle. It's not just God's taking away my anger, but God's taking away my, God's taking away these bad things. He just doesn't take away bad things. He adds good things. Why would he add the good things? Why does he add the good things? You know why he adds the good things? To allow us to be useful. That's what it says here. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. 
Later on, however, it produces a harvest of right, a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet, so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. Let me tell you what this is saying. When we think of being holy, we think of kind of leading the way spiritually. You know, I spend more time in the Bible, and I read more, and I'm more obedient, and, and that's the way we tend to think about holiness. Holiness is not demonstrated out in front of the pack. Not according to this passage. What it's describing, those who are holy aren't at the front of the pack leading the way. Those who are holy, who have been disciplined, are moving towards the rear of the pack. Why would they move to the rear of the pack? Because there's people with feeble arms and weak knees. There's people that can't keep up. There's people that are falling by the wayside. And the people that have been disciplined understand what it's like to feel pain. And you know what they do? They linger back to the rear of the pack. And they, they find those people that are struggling to keep up, and they come alongside them, and they stoop to just like Jesus did. And this is where holiness is evidenced, not out in front, but behind, looking for the people who are falling away. And I know exactly what you mean. I know exactly what it's like, maybe because I've been, been there. Somebody who has something to give these people in the back, is that you? Is that you? You have something to give to the people who are struggling to keep up? Let me tell you about something about you. If you've got something to give somebody who's struggling to keep up, let me tell you where you got that thing. And it wasn't when things were going well and where you were saying it right. It's when you were struggling. And now you have something real for individuals who struggle. You know why? Because you've been disciplined. And because you've been disciplined, you are useful to him. Useful. You have real things. That's what biblically it says, Paul writes, and then we're done. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. You hear what that's saying? God allows his children to experience troubles so that when he comforts his children, they have something to give to someone else who needs to be comforted. So when God comforts the world, he does it through his children. And what he does to bring his children to a place where they have something, he disciplines them. Puts him in difficult places so that they will reach out, tune him in, get some things that help them to endure so they can come and stay in the back of the pack and come alongside others and help people who are struggling to keep up. Just like Jesus did. Let's stand for closing prayer. God, your word that says a lot about endurance. And the word endure means, in two different forms, to remain under and to listen under. Two words translated endurance. Remain under. Listen under. When we're in circumstances that are difficult, your purpose is not to extricate us from them. We are going to experience things and have to endure things, remain under things. And the means to do that is you want to teach us to listen under, to tune you in in the midst of difficulties, to pour out our heart to you and to bring our questions and our concerns. And what you tell us 
is the byproduct of this process. It enables us to come alongside somebody else who is struggling and in your name to comfort and to encourage and to walk with them. That's what spirituality is. That's what holiness is. That's where it's demonstrated, not out in front of the pack, arrogantly, but in the rear of the pack, humbly. Jesus' name, amen.